Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Christian Church. January 8th, we are officially in the season of Epiphany. So I would welcome you to come in and take your seats as we prepare for worship. We're checking our technology to make sure it works. I would encourage you all to take a deep breath and let it out and center yourself as we pray this morning. Holy God, light of our world, shine into this place and into our hearts and renew us as we begin our worship with you this morning. Help us to fill our hearts with joy and gratitude and set aside our complaints and our negativities for the moment so that we can truly celebrate with you. We celebrate the birth of your son. We celebrate the life of Jesus beginning as Jesus shows us the way to you. Amen. Let us join in. Come as the, now is the time to worship. Feel free to rise if you choose. And now is morning. We do have a couple announcements this morning. Uh, Monday, which is tomorrow on the 9th, we have a 4 p.m. worship committee meeting. And on the 17th at 6 p.m., we have our board meeting. Maggie, do we have elders scheduled yet? No. Okay. That's okay. And then I think Dave has an announcement. Go 
So I'm sure, uh, hopefully all of you have noticed that uh, there are ballots in the back. Is there anybody that hasn't seen that or have one? The purpose of those ballots are to, we're having a congressional vote, congregational vote. <laughs> I'm so used to you, you, you've been watching the house meetings, right? Yeah. We are a congregation, not to be confused with the congregation, <laughs> congressional. Yeah. Bottom line is we will not collect those ballots till the end. We're going to do our service. It gives you time to contemplate on how you want to vote. It is to bring glory in as a, I want to make this clear, is it's a part-time position as a transitional interim pastor. I look at that as a way for our church to kind of steady our boat as we move to clearer waters. That being said, we have duties as a congregation to support whoever we put in leadership positions, as well as those in leadership positions need to support the congregation. So keep that in mind as we move forward. That's all I'll say about that. If people want more information, I think it's been out there. Yes, Brenda. When will we know the results of the vote? Uh, looking at the size of the crowd here, we, we have two counters. Uh, it will be pretty quickly right after the service is completed. So hang around and we'll we'll have the vote tally. Any other? That's a good question. Thank you. Any others? With that, we're going to move on to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> Yep, we're oh, yeah, Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Our scripture for today is Hosea 11, 1 through 4 and 7 through 9. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the balls and offering incense to idols. Yes, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the most high they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Please bless the hearing and reading of his word. So I had some fun um, down in Arizona with family. And I was able to zoom a little bit and get some videos from my brother who has a now 18 month old little girl that I haven't met yet in person. Um, but just watching some of those little videos, I always like, it's amazing to me, like my brother and I didn't get along real well when I was a kid. <laughs> we didn't like each other very much. Um, probably because I was a little, and I'm not gonna say that word in church. <laughs> But uh, I, I just wasn't uh, a, a friendly little sister for the most part. Um, but watching my brother um, suddenly have this precious little life that he's taken care of um, really warmed my heart. And she is a little curly haired um, sprite and loves to, you know, carry things around in her mouth like a puppy and, you know, all these different things. But I think about these things and I think about like what a responsibility is for a parent to have a child. Anyone who's raised a child knows, anyone who's interacted with children as a teacher, um, as a, with Sunday school or with regular school or daycare, anyone who's interacted with that, maybe it's just your grandchildren, you see this precious little life and you start to realize the responsibility that you carry. We just celebrated the birth of Christ, right? This little tiny infant that holds all of the hope and the promise for the world. This little tiny baby that we were called to nurture and protect, who's going to grow up and become our Messiah, right? So now we enter into the season of Epiphany, and Epiphany is here. Epiphany is really to show us through the life of Jesus, we learn what it means to be faithful to God. We learn how to interact with each other and how to interact with the world and how to maintain this balance that we're called to maintain. So in this season, we see God as a child. We see God as loving parent because we have both, right? We have God and we have Jesus. In parenting, and, and I, I do attachment theory parenting classes, and we talk about the balance of parenting being bigger, stronger on one side and wiser, kind on the other. And it's like this teeter-totter. And we want to make sure that we maintain that balance because if we're always bigger and stronger, we become mean. If we're wiser and kind all the time, we become weak. And if we get really frustrated, sometimes if we're not careful, we're just gone. 
The goal is balance, right? So it's neither big or strong or <laughs> big or strong or wise or kind. It's both and because we have to maintain balance and we don't want to grow too frustrated or we will be gone. This is the same image that our scripture is calling us to today. God as parent, or even some would suggest mother. Israel, this new nation of God, these children of God, is the child here. And God is calling Israel out of Egypt. God wants his child. Their child to grow and flourish. Will Gaffney writes that God takes the not yet toddler, that's Israel, right? God takes the not yet toddler by the arms and supports them as they learn to walk. God also bends over the child and feeds it. Some might say, arguably, that God lifts the child to God's breast and nurses it. Calling her child out of Egypt is the act of a protective mother. It's a different image for us. God as mother and protector. Hosea is one of our prophets. And the prophets of the day, they offered a religious interpretation of the events of the world, so political and international, and the things that were influencing their nations. It's our unfaithfulness that brings disaster to in the prophet's tellings, and that faithfulness is rewarded. This is not prosperity gospel. Please don't misunderstand me. But our faithfulness, our listening to God, our putting God first, helps us manage the events of this world when we look at who we worship. At the time of Hosea and Amos, at the time of these prophets, there was turmoil and political unrest. King Jeroboam II had died and the succession line included six more kings, five of whom were assassinated. Political unrest, turmoil. There was corruption. There was economic abuse and the rift between poor and wealthy grew and grew and grew. Sound familiar? Look at our world today. Pain, turmoil, division, conflict, corruption. These are not isolated from the church. These are a testament to our faith. Maybe. Who and what do we put first? They would say that in this passage, we see God as parent and protector. God as a frustrated parent and protector, right? We've got God looking at being on the verge of destroying Israel. Now, custom of the day, let's go back. Custom of the day in those times, and we're talking about like 750 to 720 before Common Era, the custom of the day was parents could go and petition if they had a son who was belligerent or not responding well. Parents can petition and file a complaint and have their child stoned to death. Now, that seems a little harsh to our day, right? But that's what, the, that's what it was then. And so that's the imagery that this prophet is using to describe God and his child, God's child, Israel, right? So God is so frustrated with Israel. Israel's not paying attention. Israel's not listening, not doing what God has asked Israel to do. And so God is at that place where human law would allow the child to be killed. 
And God is on that verge, like, oh, this is getting bad. But then God's all of a sudden, God is looking at this and doesn't want, doesn't want to destroy Israel. God balks at that, at that idea. And that gives way to God's growing compassion. God's attached to Israel. Like a parent is attached to a child. God is attached to Israel. And so God transcends human law and says, no, I'm not going to destroy. I'm not going to bring my wrath to this. But God does offer a warning. You may be returning to Egypt. To return to Egypt for them meant slavery. It meant hopelessness. It meant despair. No freedom and no choice. The prophets challenge us to reckon seriously with religious and political choices before us and to learn the lessons of our own history. It's really important. The prophets were challenging the people of the day to learn the lessons of their own history. And they challenge us to do the same. We look at the prophet Hosea. And we look at this image of God as parent and we as children. And I hope that we heed the warning. We too could return to Egypt. If we ignore the racial and ethnic tensions and the, the hostilities that are rampant in our world today. It's hard for us sometimes to look at God as evolving. We want God to be this static figure. But God created and creation was new. And throughout the First Testament or the Hebrew Bible, we see God as, a, as acting almost as a parent trying to figure out ways to get Israel to listen. Trying to get these new children to grow and to learn and to rejoice. And then we watch God get super frustrated. What does God do, right? There's the flood. So most of humanity and most of creation is wiped out, obliterated, right? There's some wrath happening there. And we struggle with that because we don't want to see God as having that capacity. But if God truly is all that we believe God to be, then wrath is part of that. If you've been a parent, you've felt some of that. If you've interacted with children or watched other people interact with children, you've seen some of that. Hopefully it gets managed in a good way. If not, I hope people intervene. But then God tries again to reach these children that aren't listening. And God tries again and again and again. And finally, God's like, I need something different. And maybe I'm missing the mark. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what God was thinking, but God decided we needed something different. Maybe it was, I, maybe God's been knocking on this door for so long that he said, they're not going to listen to me, but maybe they'll listen to this infant. Maybe if I offer them myself in a way they can see me and hear me and value me, maybe I can reach them. And so God sent God's son, tiny little baby, for us to love and cherish, to watch grow. Someone who could experience life as we do, who could see the day-to-day the -day struggles that we have and to help offer us a different way to live through them. God's reaching all the time. God's trying to teach us all the time. And God wants us to have a life worth rejoicing. That's what God wants for us. That's what God wanted for Israel. It's what God still wants for us. We see it in our scriptures all the time. God's patience, God's frustration, God's love, and God's compassion, and God's mercy. If we look at the scriptures, we tend to, to want to gloss over our first testament, right? We tend to want to gloss over the Hebrew Bible because there's imagery in there that we're not comfortable with. 
I would encourage you to go back to some of those scriptures, especially those places that bring you discomfort and bring them forward and let's talk about it. Because Hosea is actually famed for using the language of marriage and prostitution. It's in our scriptures as descriptors of God. There's a reason for that. But if it makes us uncomfortable and we don't want to look at it, we, we miss the lesson, right? Hosea starts off with the imagery of husband and wife, God as husband and Israel as an adulterous wife. Then it moves into this parent-child metaphor where we're at today. And it ends combining the two. But ultimately, God is our caring parent and we are the rebellious children. And this is nurturing and sustaining love. We look at this and we say, what is the love of a parent to child? What is God's relationship to us? It's not good or bad. It's not a polar opposite here. It's a both and. Because God's creative and encourages us to share love between each other and with God, God's instructive. God wants us to learn and, and understand and to, to continue to search out a better way of being with each other, a better way of being present with God and keeping God at our center. God's tolerant and patient. If it wasn't the case, we wouldn't be here, right? The love is unconditional. God loves us often in spite of ourselves. God's corrective. God intervenes. That's that bigger, stronger sometimes that we need. You know, you get that knock on the door. You get that knock on the door. Eventually, you get hit in the head with the hammer, right? Because if we're not listening, there's a way to pay attention. And it's going to happen. Sometimes we need that correction, whether we like it or not. We have to be willing to learn from it. But that's God's bigger, stronger, right? Most of the time in our scriptures, we experience God as being wiser, kind, healing, helping us to return to wholeness, helping us to rediscover the best parts of our humanity, especially as we encounter the worst part of them. God is our Lord of light. God has created a new thing with Jesus. God coming down taking the form of a child, an adolescent, a young man, a rabbi, a teacher, so that we can see a different way, so that we can truly connect. Instead of God out there, it's God in here, God immediately, like a baby in your arms. God's love for all of us. I want to share with you a different reading of this scripture. How profoundly I love my children, whom I have created and to whom I have imparted my spirit, our great God is saying to us today. I continue to reveal to them my compassion. I help to bear their burdens and accompany them through the adversities that afflict them. I heal many of their sicknesses and demonstrate my loving concern in the midst of their deep sorrows and excruciating sufferings. I hold out to them my salvation and invite them to partake of my saving and redeeming grace. Yet they turn from me to pursue their own objectives. They expand their energy upon or seek for security and comfort from the tangible things about them, even those things that have come from my hand. Even those who honor me with their lips persist in dedicating their lives to foolishness of the world about them. What more can I do for my beloved children than I am already doing? It is even as I love them and because I love them, that I must allow them to go their own way, to satisfy their desires upon the husks of their temporary existence 
to fill their emptiness with those things that rust and decay and will pass away. When they refuse to follow me, I will follow them. Even into the dark, cave, cold caves of nothingness, into the pits of despair, seeking always to draw them back to my redeeming love, to restore them to my will for them. I can do no more for my children until they return to me and commit themselves to my orbit for their lives. It was by an author named Brand. As we look into our world and as we enter this new year and this new season, I would encourage each of us to take a look at things. We tend to want to say that we are a New Testament church. We aren't an Old Testament church or a New Testament church. We are both and. We need the First Testament. We need the Hebrew scriptures to inform us, to let us see that God has continued to try to find ways to reach us. I know you've heard me say this before, but I believe fully that God reaches us in the way we are most willing to listen. God keeps knocking. God will pound on that door. God will break that door down if God needs to. But God is continually reaching to us. But God seeks ways that we are willing to hear God. Maybe it's through the infant. Maybe it's through a voice or a mentor that you followed or willing to listen to. Maybe it's a parent. But God reaches us in the way we are most willing to hear God. Our world would have us believe that it is an either or. You're either Republican or Democrat. You're either progressive or conservative. You're either pro-life or not. Our world would have us be polarized, finding opposition and reasons to amplify our frustrations, reasons to turn our view outward and say, I can dislike you, I can hate you, I can push all of the negativity away from me. God is our light and God calls us to look inward. Money, power, our economic situation, our poverty in our world, our food scarcity, all of these things. Take a look inward. Is money bad? No. Money can do great things. How we use it tells us what we need to know, right? If I allow money to become my idol, if I allow money to be my greed and my desire of wealth or my, de my desire of stuff, if I allow that to separate me from God, it's an idol, right? And I put myself at risk of returning to Egypt, right? Because money and power and greed can corrupt. They're not bad in and of, of themselves. Money's not bad. Power's not necessarily bad. We all have some of it to some one degree or another, but it's how we use those things. Our political views, same thing. If we allow God at our center and we look inward and we say, okay, how do I bring love to this situation? If we allow God to inform those decisions rather than the world driving us to either side, we begin to understand that it's living intention that God calls us to. It's not choosing sides. It's not either or. It's not this or that. It's truly how do we learn to live in the tension of what is in our world today and what could be in our world tomorrow because God and Jesus they call us to bring what could be to reality today love and justice are not mutually exclusive but there is tension between them because it's very hard to love Judas right it's easy to say there's a betrayer at the table and cast all of our our animosity to that betrayer, but the reality is we're all a little bit of Judas, right? 
I hope that love wins in our hearts most often. I hope that when we start encroaching on life taking over, getting too busy, focusing too much on money, focusing too much on maintaining our power structures, I hope that we let God's light into our hearts and we say, is this the best response out of love? What can we do more of? What could I do differently in my own life? I also hope that as we look around and we embark on a journey of transformation, that we begin to look inward and say, I felt myself have judgment in that moment. What does it say about me? Not what does it say about them, but what does it say about me individually? What does it say about you? And then we take it a step further and we say, what does it say about us? And how do we help lift each other up to a better point of view and a better work for the common good? God's love is with us through it all, unconditionally offered to us. It's up to us to accept it. It's up to us to foster it, to nurture it, to let it shape us into better children of God. It's a journey. We're in it together. And God is always with us. Our parent nurtures and sustains us. And we as rebellious children have a choice. We can continue to rebel and push back and fight amongst ourselves. Or we can start listening for God's call in our hearts, for God's call to us as church, and for God's call to us in our community. Who do we want to be? Where do we want to go? For me, I want to live in the tension of and. I don't want either or. And I definitely don't want but. We hear that all the time, right? Someone will say something beautiful, but. And they say something else. What do you hear? You don't hear the good stuff. You hear the but and you hear what came after. I love you, but. I care for you, but God doesn't ever use but with us. God says, I love you and. I love you and I want you to do better. I love you and I know you're struggling. I love you and celebrate this life, this gift you've been given, this creation you've been offered. Celebrate it. Celebrate it in here and celebrate it out there together. That's who we're called to be as children of God. Amen. As we move into our time of prayer, I would encourage you to, to speak out loud. I'll, I'll open it, speak out loud, any concerns, celebrations you have. And then I'll close us in prayer and we'll share the our Father. For those of you who aren't familiar, it's in your bulletin. I have been told that Barb Creel is out of the hospital. So we lift that up as a celebration. She's feeling better. That's exciting. Um, and so we begin. And I'm actually gonna begin this a little bit with a confession first. I know it's not something we do as disciples very often, but I really enjoy the words of Linda Hollies. So as we pray, Lord of light and ability to see, we confess our sin of ignoring you and refusing to open our eyes to your radiance. Your light causes us to look inward to change and not outward to blame others. Your light pulls us up to action instead of down to hopelessness. Your light means transformation and change. Your light scares us. Forgive us, we pray for our sin. And holy God, we lift up today our celebrations and our joys. We offer you the concerns of our hearts, and we ask for your guidance through our struggles. For what and for whom do we pray today?
assistant or as she uh, struggles with it. Bernie and Kay keep them in our hearts. We know how much they enjoy our church and so we um, send our blessings. Students see Rhoda and PJ. God of mercy and of grace, we offer up our wounded, our ill, our sick, our tired, and our hungry to your care. We celebrate with you the joys of our hearts, the love where we can find it, and the beauty of this world around us in those tiny fleeting moments where we bear witness to all that you have offered us. Help us always to keep you at our center as we pray the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join us as we have to hear. I came across this quote about our scripture today, and it goes like this. This scripture is a discussion of how we are tied to God by bonds of love, bonds that we can't get out of, however far from God we walk. 
I find this quote incredibly encouraging when thinking of all the ways I have kept my distance from God or have found reasons to be mad at him. When I shy away from him because I don't understand the why behind so many things happening in this world today. What a great reminder that no matter what we do or how far we stray, he is always right there whenever we cho choose to come back to him. And he loves us just the same. He does not scold us for running away. He doesn't take away our allowance or our phones and send us to bed without any dinner. He simply wraps us up in his love like we had never left. And one of the ways we come back to Jesus every week is at his table. Please help me affirm that all are welcome. Christ. Communion in our church is open, so all are truly welcome at the table. We do have, and we have wafers. There are gluten-free options in the back, but just outside the door, bring them in. And we have the individual cups for people who can put them. On that night, when Jesus sat with his disciples, that last supper, he took bread, common bread, and he broke it and he shared it with them, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take, eat, and remember. And so too, he took a cup, poured wine, he shared it with them, and he said, this is the hope and promise of a new covenant, a new way of being. Take, drink, and remember. Please pray with me. Father God, I am amazed by your compassion and mercy. I am humbled by your undeserved forgiveness. I am, I am overwhelmed by your majesty of goodness. Thank you for binding me to yourself with hands of love.
For our offering today, I want to um, share a prayer with you in my account. Please pray with me. An offertory prayer, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can always trust in you. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please now take it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Extend and multiple, multiply its reach and influence, we pray. May it be a great blessing to many. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Um, please join us at the final table. benediction, but I'm inviting Dave, our board moderator, up um, to do our business meeting. Yeah. So the, uh, is there anybody that hasn't cast a ballot? Hearing none, Brenda, you want to let them know that the ballots are all in? So what we're going to do, we're just going to, if we were in the military, I'd say, uh, Addy, smoke them if you got them. <laughs> Just to let you know, we have to, we're going to undecorate the church today. So if you can stay around and help with that, I don't think the counting will take too long. A um, couple things, just as long as I'm up here, I'll tell you some of the processes we went through. For your information, our bylaws say that for a interim pastor, that only requires two thirds of the board vote. So you might ask, well, why are we voting? This is the interim. It's a hybrid, it's a transitional position also. A full pastor being called, uh, I don't know if I'd say full pastor, but there, it, it, the terminology may not be quite correct, but for a pastor to be called for a full-time mission here, it requires two thirds of the vote of the congregation. So it's a little gary area. This is a interim, it's transitional. Uh, for the board, we felt it'd be important that the congregation has a voice for transparency. And honestly, for them to hear that we have responsibilities as a, as a congregation, as well as a pastor. I won't go through all the transitional interim ministry covenant, but I would, and to paraphrase a lot of it is, you know, we have responsibilities as does the pastor. And my vote counter is already here, and I don't know if you just want me to come back and get or if you just want to ask. Okay. Okay. 
Mm. Well, maybe I would want to do an award ceremony <laughs> where you the envelope and the suspense is, I am very happy to announce Gloria has been chosen for the calling of being our transitional in-room pastor. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Pastor. Celebrate, Brenda. Hello. Since this is a transitional interim minister, does the congregation have any duties that we are supposed to do to support her? Yeah, we've got a whole list of them. Do you want me to go through those? Excuse me? Oh, uh, good, good point. Uh, how do you look at that? Am I supposed to? You're on. You're on. You just, you just got to talk. Oh, is there any questions from those on Zoom? Oh, one oh what are our duties as a congregation? Or do we? We have a whole list. The congregation shall be fully engaged in the transitional process as conducted by contracted transformation consultant as led by the TIM during the transitional period. You know what? There's a, a lot of these, but honestly, it is seen we support her. We're not going to throw out roadblocks. Doesn't mean you have to agree pastors or pastors. She's our leader at this point. If you have questions about what your responsibilities are, they're no different than what we've been doing at supporting our leadership, Brenda. Can it be placed in any meetings what the congregational responsibilities are? Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Brenda asked, are our duties and responsibilities? And there's, there's duties and responsibilities on both sides. This is a covenant, uh, a pleasant way to say a contract that Gloria is engaging with the congregation. And yeah, there's monetary things that we probably won't put out, but there is. Uh, and let me also point out that this is a part-time position. We are anticipating that Gloria is, we're, we're going to be transitioning, just as it says, with how do we move forward? How do we make this work in the interim of, well, oh, gee, interim pastor, until we find the calling of a permanent pastor, I guess is maybe how you look at that. And that can take some time. The nice thing about being transitional designation is it allows Gloria to be a part of that search process. Not that she gets to be on the search committee, but she can apply to be our minister. That's the difference between an interim and a transitional interim is it allows the transitional to be in the pool of those that can be uh, called. So the congregation still has a lot of work because eventually it leads you towards a search committee for the final calling. Hopefully that helps. Um, I have really nothing else unless there's some more questions. We can have the benediction and tear things down. <laughs> Brenda, I do appreciate your questions and you know, sometimes you get up here and just you forget things, and it really does help to have people out there to prod you for information. Dave's doing a great job. Oh, thanks, Brad. <laughs> yeah, let's go round of applause. Yeah. So when we talk about responsibilities, I think the biggest thing to remember, and you've journeyed with me for a lot of years. But the biggest thing to remember is that our greatest responsibility is to listen, to listen to God and to listen to one another and to be vulnerable enough to share our thoughts, our disagreements, our frustrations. I want to hear them all because that's how we grow together as a congregation. That's how we grow together as a community is only by sharing those things, listening, sharing, or as our official words are, we reach, we teach each other, and we rejoice together. As you move forward into the day, as you move forward into your week, I hope 
that you will hold in your hearts that loving spirit of God as parent and remember that we are all children on a journey together. Go in peace, view the wonder and awe of God's creation and find joy in every moment that you can. Amen.